What's up, everybody? Welcome in to another episode of the Celtics Iron Dumpster Fire Talk podcast <laughs> here on the NBC Sports Boston Podcast Network. Yeah, we've been doing this show for two years. We just rebranded the title uh, because Tom E. Giles, this team is uh, about a bit of, uh, you know, I don't know. Like, I, I keep, we said like five times last year they've hit rock bottom and then they would find a new rock bottom. Like, I, I'm, I'm I'm hesitant to say they reached a new low, but last night, blowing a 19-point lead, uh, getting outscored 37-9 to to start the fourth quarter by the Chicago Bulls, losing by double digits. Um, are we at rock bottom? No, I, I think there's still uh, a little ways to go. Oh, yeah. there's more. There's, there's even more. It can get even worse. It can. It absolutely can. It, it, by the way, if you just shut the game off after three quarters last night, you saw an extremely entertaining game. Like you saw yeah. some great pace, some great energy. Like you saw some really good basketball. If you kept it on for the fourth quarter, uh, things obviously all fell apart. It, it can, it can get worse. And uh, I, I think that you have to look at what are these post-game comments going to do to this team? You know, is it, is it going to continue to pull them apart? Is Ime Udoka somehow going to step in there and say, all right, we got to, we got to band together here. We got to show some cohesiveness. But the fact that you had Marcus Smart sounding off after the game, and I, I think even more egregious was Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown not <laughs> talking at all. Like uh. everyone today wants to go after Marcus Smart for what he said after the game, but I don't. I don't see a lot of people talking about the fact that Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum just sat that one out. You, you kind of you, you have to be accountable after that kind of loss. Yeah, so I'm glad you brought up Marcus uh, and what he said. Let's actually just let's give people what they want to hear. Here's Marcus Smart after last night's game uh, with some opinions on the the Jays and ball movement and stuff. I mean, it's only so much I can do without the ball in my hands. I just sit and stand in the corner. Um, we run in plays for our best players. Every team knows that we, you know, and uh, they do a good job of shutting that down. And you know, we we can't allow that. You know, when they shut that down, we can't keep trying to go to those guys. We gotta, you know, abort that. And, you know, find another way to get them the ball in the spots that they need the ball. Um, and like I said, for me, it's, I can only do so much with just standing in the corner or when I come up and give the ball away. So, um, you know, I do everything I can on the other end to try to combat that. Um, you know, I try to talk. You know, I try to, you know, make the plays, get those guys the ball where they need it, where they want it. Uh, but yeah. I mean, there's been a lot of kind of trying to target mismatches and go to the post or isolation for the you know, OJB and JT. Would you rather kind of stick with the more complex plays in the crunch time and try to just find that flow? I mean, I would just like to play basketball. You know, every team knows we're trying to go to Jason and Jalen. And every team is programmed and studied to stop Jason and Jalen. And, you know, I think everybody's scouting report is make those guys try to pass the ball. They don't want to pass the ball. And that's something that they're going to learn. They're still learning, you know. And we're proud of the, the, you know, the progress they're making. But they're going to have to make another step and find ways to not only create for themselves but create for others on this team um, to open up the court for them later down in the in the game where they don't have to always take those tough shots or um, take uh, tough matchups when they do get the one on one and then you bring in the trap. Um, just reading that, um, and it's something that you know we've been asking for them to do. Uh -huh. And they're learning, you know. So we we just got to continue to help those guys do that and to help our team. Okay, so I'm gonna admit, in the moment, like, <laughs> I, and I hate to make this comparison, it felt a little bit like Kyrie, where I think Marcus Smart was well intentioned. He's trying to say, like, you know, we can't just be a predictable offense. Like the the fourth quarter, especially when teams are uh, are keying on the Jays. We got to find unique ways to, to get play. And like they got away from what was working for three quarters. So I get what he was saying. The fact that he had to bring up the part about him standing in the corner and making it sound like he was a little frustrated with his role in that offense is where he kind of went off the, 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 the road a little bit. Like there was a way to offer criticism and push the Jays. And then Marcus might have just didn't form the, the thought perfectly. And as you said, now they've got a little bit of a situation where if Jalen Brown didn't go to the podium, Jalen Brown was the only one scheduled to go to the podium last night and okay. ultimately said, I'm not, I'm not going. The fact that Tatum didn't say, Hey, I should go to the podium on this night is also concerning. I think I was the one who said in the, uh, before, I, I, I've got like 9,000 thoughts bubbling here about the Jays, but let's start with, with smarts comments. 
if you're Jalen Brown and you hear as, as, as word starts to get back to you about what Marcus Smart is saying, do you think that played into Jalen's decision to kind of sit that one out? Um, and how much are, are you worried that it will create a bigger mess because of what Marcus said? How many shots did Jalen Brown take in the fourth quarter? Uh, two. And they he were both with two. under three minutes to play. Okay. So I know that his comments were directed at Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, but Jalen Brown took two shots on a night. He was playing pretty well. So I, who, does, I, who does that fall? Who does that fall back on? Well, I just, honestly, there's a little bit of truth in what Marcus Smart is saying where the ball moves for three quarters. Yeah. They play, you know, obviously it's tough to play in transition when you don't get a single stop on the other end and they were not getting a single stop defensively against the bulls. So it's kind of tough to get out. Zero. Zero. So, so that's going to affect really how your offense runs in transition. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, the ball was moving in the first few quarters. And then in the fourth quarter, and this has kind of been the case for the Celtics in these clutch moments anyways, it just sticks. Mm-hmm. And what's the easiest thing to defend? One guy with the ball just trying to dribble right at you or trying to shoot over you, right? You're not making the Bulls work at all uh, uh, on the other side of the floor. So, of course, they've got plenty of energy to get up and down in transition. Chicago does. There, there's definitely some truth to the fact that the Celtics just do not move the ball late in these games, and they didn't do it for the fourth quarter. Yeah, you would have thought the Bulls would be more tired after beating them mercilessly for the first 10 minutes of the fourth quarter. But no, uh, they kept their foot on the gas, unlike the Celtics, uh, to the finish line there. So uh, two things. The Jays, not talking. This is somewhat – and I, I get it. If Jalen Browns ultimately comes out – today, tomorrow, whenever the next time we hear from these guys and says, you know what? I just didn't want to pour any more gasoline on this fire. It was already like, I was frustrated with my, my role there. And like, I didn't want to make it worse. Um, but you can also come to the podium and say that and be like, Hey, look, I'm not taking any questions tonight. I'm just going to tell you, I'm frustrated. We got to figure this thing out. I'm getting in the lab with these guys tomorrow. We're going to get this thing worked out. And then you, 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 you depart, you know, Tatum, not going to the podium. I was one who sat here before the season and said, like, I think the Jays need to be the captains of this team. They need to be further emboldened to, to lead this group. And last night, I'm looking at Marcus Smart and Al Horford going to the podium. And we can debate all we want about whether Marcus Smart's comments are going to help. But at least he was up there and, and taking some accountability for the way that played out. Uh, misguided on a night that he had zero assist in 31 <laughs> minutes, but um, you know it, it, it's still at least taking a little bit of the accountability. I'm worried. Do, do, do you should I be worried about the Jays and leadership? So when you bring up Jalen Brown and he could have gone to the podium and said the right things, he almost always goes mm-hmm. to the podium and says the right things. So I, I wonder what is at play there because Jalen Brown is so good at just stepping up there and saying what needs to be said. And he does it even when he's, you know, being somewhat uh, diplomatic in his answers. He For still sure. does it with, with a shred of honesty as well, where, you, you know, you, you feel like, all right, that was a pretty genuine answer from Jalen right mm-hmm. there. So I, he kind of has to be that vocal leader. He's got to be the guy that puts out the message for this team. That's not going to be Jason Tatum. I don't know if that's ever going to be Jason Tatum, who, you know, sometimes the body language on the floor and even mm-hmm. afterwards mm-hmm. is just – Oh, we're you gonna know, get into it's, that. It's it's not what you need to see. I I, I would like to see Jalen Brown in that in that situation step up and, and kind of deliver that message. I the other wrinkle to this, Chris, that I find interesting because we could talk about how Jalen and Jason kind of respond to Marcus Smart's comments or what they think of it. What does Ime Udoka think of it right now? You know, does Udoka <laughs> like the fact that Marcus Smart's saying, "Look, the ball can't stick like this," or does Udoka say, "All right, well, is he coming after me for allowing this to happen?" Yeah, it, 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 it's fascinating. I think there. I think you can take it either which way. So I think Ime has shown he's okay with his players having a voice like that. But yeah, like uh, the one thing I walked away from in the immediate aftermath was I said, all right, Ime couldn't go to the podium and kill them because he just did that a couple nights ago. And they did respond. You know, they, they had a better game in Charlotte and Jalen, chief among them, you know, ramping it up. Um, Would have been better to get a win, but did not. And so now, like, could he come back out and, 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 and really put their feet to the fire again? I don't know. So I think he had to be diplomatic there and say there was three quarters of advancement and, but hold them and say like that, you know, you got to get to the finish line and, and all that. Uh, I wonder if he then deployed smart with a little bit of, Hey, feel free to kind of, you know, (laughs) roast them a little bit. Uh, I don't know. You know, so I, I am like left with this appetite for what comes next because, uh, they, it could galvanize this team and force them to address 
some issues that for whatever reason they haven't addressed over the past 18 months. Um, or it could cause them to further splinter and amid a two and six start and two and five start here, like, uh, make you question, you know, what comes next and, you know, what changes have to be made. I think that's probably getting a little bit too far ahead. Uh, but you know, Hey, look, not, nothing is too early with this team based on the fact that we started for an entire season last year and nothing seems to be changing this year. You brought up Tatum. I think it's, 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 it's fascinating. There was one play that drew my ire. Uh, with about four minutes to go, Celtics down. Did you tweeted four. out the video. Yeah, and yeah. so you know, my, I've had an issue with Tatum and his sort of protesting calls for for a while now. I thought Ime Udoka did uh, as much as he could in the preseason. Came out probably one of his first training camp practices and said, "Hey, let me do the uh, the arguing. You guys get back on defense." Uh, held that up when Grant Williams stepped out of line. But we've now had multiple instances where Tatum has either, you know, got a technical for complaining or has just been repeatedly been late getting back. And I don't care how talented you are, you know, like there's no denying Jason Tatum is a elite player in this league, but not when he does that. And I think that if we're talking about like what's stopping Jason Tatum from being going to that next level, like he's an all-star. I'm not going to, I shouldn't say elite. He's an all-star player in this league. He's an all NBA in the past, but What's stopping him from going to that next level is an inability when shots aren't falling to sort of get past it and figure out how to help this team in other ways. And chief among them is getting his ass back on defense. Uh, It was was such a clear play because I I remember watching it at the time and, you know, he goes to the rim. He doesn't get the call. You see the arms. He didn't deserve a call. You see the arms go up right away and then back the other way. It wasn't it wasn't like an immediate transition bucket. No. What was worse, it, it was a five-on-four bucket, right? Chicago just identified, all right, well, they got four guys back. Who's the open man? And it led to an easy two because Jason Tatum is just late getting back on that play. I think that's frustrating for anybody that's watching. It, it, if you're going to miss a shot, you got to go get the ball back. Right. I mean, that's, that's the one thing where, you know, people want to complain about Marcus Smart. He loses the ball. He tries to get it back right away. You know, and Mm -hmm. I understand that that's probably a little more like, oh, that's high school basketball, college basketball, the hustle plays, everything else. But when you're watching a guy who's contesting a call in a game where things are getting away from you, but it's still close and you don't get back on defense against a team that's making absolutely everything, it's hard to watch. Yeah. And that to me is is, is this team in a microcosm where, you know, they just can't get past the frustrations, these like small moments. And like, look, all right, that the run was pretty pronounced at that point. But even in that little instance where they're just so desperate to actually get a stop, but they can't collect themselves in that instance. And I just don't get it. You know, I want to come down on Ime Yudoka, but like Brad Stevens couldn't get them to do that. And now, you know, this is a pattern with the players. And I just wonder if for whatever reason, and I, I don't, I can't explain it. You know, people keep saying it, you know, is it, is it their mindset? You know, is there any sense of entitlement? I keep saying, like, what have they accomplished yeah. recently that makes you feel like that you can play like this, that you Oops. don't have to put in the effort for a full four quarters, that you could take your foot off the gas against a good team? I just, you know, is is the where, who, Tommy Jolly, you know what I love? We we haven't done Blaine Pie in a while. <laughs> who, it's harder on a how, podcast. Too. It really is. I don't have any graphics or anything like that with a bow tie on. So how we... Uh, just because we're spitballing and I just yeah. thought of this and I love blame pie. What, 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 how are you carving that cake right now? If you had to do a sign, at least for the start of this season, uh, it's, it's going to come down to, I would, I would lump in, you know, cause they want to, they want to lump in Marcus smart with Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. So mm-hmm. those three guys, they deserve at least 70% of Woo! what's going on this season. At least look, wow. look, look at the other side. Al Horford is playing like he's 28 years old. That's maybe one of the more disappointing parts of this start of the season is that Al Horford is playing with bounce. And you think you're getting that for 82 games? You're definitely not because he's going to be sitting out a couple games for rest anyways. He played so well again last night. And you're seeing him just bust his ass. And you're thinking, okay, they're getting what they need from everyone else on the floor. Is Robert Williams going to stay healthy the whole year, Chris? I know he's your guy, but you know what? I hold my breath on that because just when, just when we thought the podcast couldn't get any more negative. I'm sorry. <laughs> when he lived you know, off he's, last night, he's been good. He's been yeah, he good. Has. And that, that, that's the problem. Like you were fully healthy last night. Mm. I've got to put the onus on those three guys. This is supposed to be their team. And you know what? Clutch late situations. They haven't been good. No. I mean, obviously, they've tied a couple of games. They've forced some overtimes, but you've got to win those. And, and 
I want to let you get in your blame pie, but I also want to talk about killer instinct because yeah. oh, one hundred percent because so, it, it, so that, let, that's let me, like a factor that people talk about. For sure, let me let, my my blame pie would be very similar. I think the players deserve the bulk of it because we have now had two coaches who I like people tell me are very good and like who I think like Brad Stevens was a very good coach. Uh, not sure I understood the the whole stepping down thing. I think Ime Udoka is a very good coach. Uh, there's things he can work on, and I'll get into that too, but. Um, you know, ultimately I think it's the mindset of these players and that's unfortunate. I just don't get, um, how they don't understand. And I think that's why Al Horford as early as last week was already kind of like somber, like, you know, maybe these guys just don't get it. And yeah. <laughs> I, I can't keep shaking this notion. Like Kyrie might've been right. Kyrie yeah. might, like, like, and, and Kyrie was very similar. And that's why it's, it's, it's so, it's so funny to me to, to be balancing this whole Marcus Smart thing, because, um, you know, while Kyrie was did not know how to correctly appropriate that message and, and say how, like, you know, that I'm trying to nurture the young guys and just wanted to blame them for any, everything. Uh, I think people are understanding now, like, yeah, those, those guys have a little bit of, of a ways to go to figure out what it means to be uh, winners in this league and what it takes and like, like the hard work and the effort you have to be willing. And, you know, I think I, I know Jalen Brown's a highly motivated player. I know Jason Tatum wants to win, but sometimes uh, it just doesn't, it doesn't translate in the moment or they're not able to catch themselves when things go bad. You mentioned the killer instinct. I, and, and let's stay on that for a second. You know, is that something they can learn? Is that something that guys just got to have? It, it's, it's so fun. weird. It, it's almost, it's almost like Jason Tatum thinks he's supposed to have that killer instinct. And that's why I see the ball kind of sticking his hands in the fourth quarter, but he just doesn't have it yet. It, to me, I, I don't know. I, I, it, it's one of those like it factor things, but killer instinct doesn't just mean going down and getting a bucket. It also means manning up on the defensive end. Yeah. Like you need guys with killer instinct defensively who are not going to allow their opponent to score no matter what. And when the Chicago Bulls, you have zero defensive rebounds in the fourth mm-hmm. quarter, that means you're not getting any stops. You're not getting any stops. And, and that's, that is that's killer in its own right. It's killer for your team. That's not the killer instinct. You need somebody to step up and get a stop. As far as Jason Tatum goes, and I think that sometimes we get, we're pretty hard on Jason Tatum, and a lot of it's because he doesn't play with the emotion that maybe we mm-hmm. want to see him play with. And especially in a city like Boston where, you know, it, it feels like you just, you want to you want to be able to see it. You want to be yeah. able to see these guys do it. Like Chris Sale always gets a pass on the Red Sox because <laughs> You see the bumps. you see the emotion, mm-hmm. and he talks about how bad he is, and then other players just are <laughs> quietly bad, and you, you know they end up getting hated because you just don't feel like they care. I think Jason Tatum cares, mm-hmm. but the problem is that his personality just there, there there isn't that emotion there. So we sometimes say, well, maybe he just doesn't have that killer instinct. I mm-hmm. I don't know whether or not you have to learn it, but right now. He doesn't have it. And their end of game possessions have been brutal. And, and so, the, and this is a whole nother, you know, thing that I'm, I'm left wondering. I think again, I'm, I'm, it's weird that a team with so much defensive talent has not been able to harness it. They have been super sloppy in late game execution, not just with the bulls game, but you know, that the, the overtime games against Charlotte, like they had multiple opportunities to win that game and Jalen Brown, not turning the corner and settling for a fadeaway Tatum fumbling the ball around then barely getting a last shot off with a chance to force a third overtime. You know, there's, there's execution issues that are, are maddening and a lot of that falls on the players, but I do have to say, you know, I, I wrote this sort of open letter to email Yudoka over the weekend. And part of it, it was like, look, first year coach, there's going to be lumps. And especially with this team uh, who is, not as talented as it seems to think it is. And, uh, you know, sometimes you just got to kind of step back and take the, the long view. Part of that is like, I want to see him playing the kids more. Well, again, we'll get into that. There's like 900 things to get into with this team, but um, he's also following a coach in Brad Stevens, who was really, really good with drawing up that must have ATO. And, yeah. you know, when the, when you wanted to at least get a, a last shot, there was two options that were going to go there. Sometimes it feels like they're like, okay, Jalen's getting the ball for the last shot, but I don't necessarily see what the second option is or what happens if the defense turns this way. There's not that next level to it. Now it's hard. Again, we don't know what he may drawing up in these huddles. Does he deserve the other 30% of, of our blame pie? So I, I'm glad you brought that up because it sounded like, and for me, you may get at least 15% of that, you know, and then there's another 15% to go around, but yeah. 
yeah, at this point, your team's two and five. And even if it is a part of the grand plan to say, all right, I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you do things the way you want to do them for the first month of the season. And then we're going to do things my way. Like that, that's a hard thing to do with a team that's got expectations to make Mm -hmm. the playoffs. Uh, And by the way, the Chicago bulls are better than you. Like that's the other thing too. Well, like we we can circle back to just how good the Celtics are, but they're better than you. So, you know, losing a 19 point lead is inexcusable at home and, and losing the way you did. That's inexcusable. Chicago is a better team than the Celtics right now and maybe by the end of the season as well. But yeah, Ime Udoka does, he does deserve some responsibility. And Chris, I think there's probably some people out there that are saying, well, maybe it's time to move on from the coach. Oh He's only gosh. seven games in. I think it's too early as well. Yeah. So did, the they, Celt- did, did they get to a point this season where they say, okay, that's, that's something we have to consider? Is it just I, not not the right fit? I mean, it's it's always on the table because, like, ultimately when your team doesn't play to a certain level, the coach is uh, in the spotlight. And we just saw it with Brad Stevens where, you know, that was more, I think, Brad looking at it and going, man, I just can't get these guys to play to that level. But now here's a second coach who, in the infancy of his first, you know, year of, as an as a NBA head coach, has not been able to do that. I do think the Celtics have been very, very, you know, um, forgiving of their coaches when they struggle. Doc Rivers had people in the crowd chanting to fire him in 2006, 2007. And like, they saw the long view. And I think they know, like they didn't hire Ime and think it was going to change everything in four games, but you do got to be a little bit more crisp. And I think it's, it's fair to be like, you know, coach has to go up to another level too. He's got to figure out how to get these guys to lock in a little bit more. This, this is the other side of it though. That I'm seeing a lot of people talking about on social media is that everyone last year wanted to blame the coach and say, yeah, well, need to make a change of coach. You're running out of people well, you, made, you made a change of coach, yeah. and now you're kind of getting the same thing over and over again, which is, again, why I give 70% of yes. the blame pie right now to those three players who have been here, who have been a part of mm-hmm. the disappointment that we've seen. It, like just, you, 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 can't, you can't keep just moving on from coaches, bringing in new guys, and, and without looking within and saying, okay – you got a real issue here with your core players. And, and yeah. that is the root of the issue. It really is. And and I mean, it was funny. Someone posted it last night. It was like, well, you can't, you can't blame Gordon Hayward's injuries. You can't, can't blame Kyrie. Right. Can't blame, can't blame Brad. Can't blame Danny Ainge's draft picks. You know, all of a sudden it gets to a point where, okay, you know, what's the common denominator. And I think, and you know, maybe that's being a little bit harsh on that group. Cause I think they have been, been good uh, in moments, but yeah, like, like this is a pattern where those are the guys and that core has not been able to, to get it done. So I do think before you'd ever think about, you know, the coach, I do think you, you start to wonder what is the right path forward for this course. So here talk it is. About that. Let's, let's talk about that. What is the right path forward? If this just doesn't work, if they, if, if for whatever reason, this only, this only causes the the core of the group to, to splinter a little bit more, causes some friction between Marcus and the Jays, Like, what is the right path forward for this team if this just if this isn't going to work? I've liked Marcus Smart as a player since he's come into the league for the Celtics. He plays with an energy that is is unrivaled, Uh, a bit reckless at times. The shot selection is not always great. But this offseason, I did want them to explore a trade with Marcus Smart. I really did. I it just. I'm not saying that it's his fault. I'm not saying that uh, it's necessarily fair to to, to put it on smart and just be like, this is the shakeup you need, but you're not going to trade Jalen Brown and you're not going to trade Jason Tatum. At least I just, I don't think you can yet. Right. So the most logical move is to trade Marcus smart and you're not waiting until the end of the season to do it because by the, by the time you get to the end of the year, you might be dealing with Jason Tatum saying, I want out of town. You know, you might be dealing with, I'm just saying you've got to do it. You have to do it in the middle of this season with things going the way they're going, unless there's a drastic change, you got to do everything you can to trade Marcus smart. And what I've been told is a tradable contract. That's all I want. If you're going to sign him to an extension, it's got to be a tradable contract. Well, they got someone that's kind of in that 15 to $20 million range. So that should be a movable piece as far as salary numbers go. Not necessarily is Marcus smart, a great player that somebody wants, but you have to do it so that you can find out. And, and again, if Marcus Smart leaves, and then two months after that, you're looking and, and saying, well, it's the same old story. Well, then you kind of oh, know boy. that it comes down to Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. I can't believe we're at this point already. I thought at least well, 20 games. You know, I know it just blows my mind that uh, 
you know, I, I had high hopes and I, I thought, especially talking to them before the season, you know, felt like the Jays were ready, that they understood the, you know, wayward ways of last season. I thought things were going to change and I bought into it. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just more of the same. And I think there's some hard questions the Celtics have to ask themselves, you know, when it comes to smart, um, I will admit, you know, I, I think I've, I said it over this, I said it, I know I said it at the end of last season, um, you know, watching Lonzo ball on the other side last night, watching him lock up Tatum, watching him direct offense and push that ball ahead. Like I was a little bit jealous, but I also yeah. understood the decision to re to, to, to extend Marcus smart. I do think it, it doesn't really change. Like, I, I think he's got a, it's easier to trade him with a, a guaranteed deal than it would be if he's just an impending free agent, your return would be, would be far less on that player. So if they do get to that difficult spot where it's like someone has to go and, and it, it's ultimately at the point guard spot, um, you know, Brad Stevens will have options, although, you know, trade value is going to be great at this point. I do wonder, you know, like watching back the fourth quarter, I don't think Marcus was the issue, but there is like the idea of why can't any of these guys just figure it out and figure out how to work together. Um, that is, that is the concerning part. Um, so the, yeah, so Brad, <laughs> Brad Stevens has got some difficult, difficult, uh, conversations to have and some, uh, you know, about the future of this ball club. So, but here, and here's the part that I don't like about trading smart. Okay. If Marcus smarts, not in that locker room last night, is anyone calling right. out the team? Is anyone calling out the team for having a, an inept, uh, just ISO ball offense in the fourth quarter? Or is everyone just whistling past the graveyard saying everything's fine? You know what I mean? Like it's, you at least have a guy who probably went a little too far with his comments and was probably a little too honest, but at least went out there and said, can't win games like this. Can't win yeah. games with the ball sticking to one side with one guy. Like that's too easy to defend. And you're not getting anyone else involved. You're, you're not making them defend the entire half court. So if you trade Marcus Smart, you do lose that. But at the same time, if you got to shake up that core, that's the first guy you look to move. And and it's funny you say that because like me and Perk were, were, were screaming about it last night. And I sort of said, you know, while some of that stuff does have to stay in the locker room and I get that point, like how many times does this have to happen before someone has to at least put the pressure on everybody to address it? And I wonder if Marcus Smart, uh, you know, again, in, a, in, a, in his own way, probably thought it would come off a little bit more positive than it did, but was trying to be like, we just can't keep having this conversation. We can't keep coming up here and being like, hey, the first three quarters were great. There's a lot of positives that we can take out of those first three quarters. Um, one other thing I want to I want to get into Uh Aaron Neesmith is on the side of this milk carton I've got in front of me. He is, he has completely disappeared. Uh, Peyton Pritchard has barely played uh, a lot of minutes for Josh Richardson. Uh, how are we feeling about, and I get it. Ime is, is feeling pressure to win, but is leaning very heavy on the veterans of this group, especially as two of them recover from COVID and injuries and all that. Uh, does Ime need to embrace the fact that if there's going to be bumps along the way, maybe they should at least play the kids. Yeah, I, I feel like uh, you do have to at some point. You need to develop these players. We saw Aaron Neesmith when he started to get some consistent minutes, really respond well last year. Mm -hmm. I think that last night maybe was an exception to the rule because you had a fully healthy lineup for the first time all season. So you were fully healthy, and I think the goal there was to win the game no matter what. And, and you know what? I think the crowd at the Garden, by all accounts, was demanding it too. Oh, for sure. Like, I, I thought that was a playoff energy atmosphere Ooh. for the first half of that game. Sir, the first half of that game was Electric. so entertaining. It Electric. was amazing. The yeah. people were into it. It was great basketball. I mean, maybe, it, it, you know, the defensive minded people were, were you know, <laughs> left wanting a little bit more. But whatever. Go watch defense on your own time. <laughs> like the first half of that game was amazing. And, and the people were into it. And maybe Ime Udoka looked at it and said, you know what? This is a game we have to win. We're fully healthy. you got to win this game at home. Beat a good team in Chicago. Yeah, Chicago is good. I, that could be part of the reason that you didn't see the young guys as much last night. But I agree with the overall point that, yes, they need to get minutes. There's no way for them to get – look, you haven't played them and you're two and five. If you had played them and you were two and five, at least they've gained experience. And maybe you're, you're three and four if you give those guys a few more minutes because it gives everyone else a little more rest. I, I do find it interesting because, you know, Udoka was asked about fatigue after the game. I know Abby asked him about it mm -hmm. uh, in her one-on-one -on -one interview, and he's like, no, no, I don't think that was a part of it at all. Are we sure? Are we sure? Five, five, yeah, like... you played five overtimes now in seven games. 
And and last night was up and down for for all four quarters. So you need they're going to need rest at some point. Yeah, yeah Al Horford, uh, absolutely. And I don't know if I can take 30 more minutes of Josh Richardson, who I, I think has actually been better than I thought, but I'm just not sure what the long-term view is you, here. You had low expectations if he's been had, better than you thought, because I, I looked at a guy who was like, he's he's someone who's played 30 minutes a game, scored you know but around 12 points a game in his mm-hmm. career. Like, that's who I kind of expected. And yeah. Mm. So, uh, but here's the thing for me with the, with the young guys, and I'm, I'm sure all, all the Celtics people are, are sick of hearing me say this, but, you know, if you are going to take your lumps, you know, if you've got to either figure out whether the four guys you just agreed, uh, you know, t- picked up their rookie extensions there or rookie, uh, rookie options, are they part of your core? Are they trade assets? And what's going on here? You know, like, okay, say you get to a point where you have to make a tough decision on trading Marcus Smart. Okay. What are you putting with him that is going to entice a team to send you back something attractive as well? It'd be a lot easier if you could say like, Hey, here's this Aaron Neesmith who's shooting 40% right. in limited minutes and needs a bigger role. Uh, maybe you'd like him or, Hey, here's Peyton Pritchard who had an excellent rookie season and is now, you know, seen his role grow instead of regress to bare bones minutes uh, to go along with them. Uh, they don't have that right now. I mean, shouldn't you know, Romeo, shouldn't Romeo be the best young <sighs> asset? Based on if, his size, if he can stay on and, the floor. And, well, I know. I, like, look, I, I, I get that guy, part of it, and I'm, pre- I'm, not love, of, I'm not in love with Romeo, but I'm, I'm just, I'm just saying, he feels like somebody that should carry the most value among that group mm-hmm. of really young bench players. And, and he might, like, I think there, it's, it, I think we get caught up with this idea of like, and, and I do it as well, where if a guy isn't playing that other teams are like, Oh, he just must stink. No teams know that there's just extenuating circumstances. Like you can look at the Celtics from afar and say, so why isn't, you know, Peyton Pritchard playing? Wasn't he like really steady last year and still think he has high value, but you know, it's a lot easier to convince that team when you have an actual NBA sample size of like playing 20 minutes in his second year to say like, there's progress here. Um, Romeo has shown me that there's a player there. Um, the minutes just might not be consistent enough. This he year he just feels him. raw. So that, that's the only reason I think that yeah. other teams will look at him and say, all right, he's still raw. They're, they're still, he's, he's still 21. Like, like it's, still it's, it's crazy. Into something. He's like seven years younger than Peyton Pritchard. So like there, there, there's, there's, there's that if teams are, are trying to figure it out. But yeah, I, I, I started to think last night, is there room for four rookies on a team like this where, or not four rookies, but four young guys, you know, uh, who are competing for minutes. It's like, if you're going to carry the Josh Richardson's of the world, then it's tough to find time for those guys. Then maybe, you know, you need to kind of pick and choose who are you riding with? Like who are the guys you're 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 moving forward with? Because the worst thing you could do is not play them and just get to the end here, and then they have no trade value. You know the Carson Edwards situation where just kind of sat there on the bench, never played, never had a chance. But like now, understandably so. Like that's why he's not in the league right now. But um, you know you got to figure out what you've got, and you got to figure out if you're investing in them. And I know that's so tough for a first year coach who's trying to win every game, uh, but that's part of the puzzle here. And I do think the Celtics need to step back and just uh, kind of like you know, take, take the bigger picture here. Like where are we going? Like, what is the plan this year? So has any, has anything yeah. about this year suggested to you that like NBA finals are bust? No, it's like, no. you know, start plotting that path forward and, you know, start doing, uh, finding ways to win the hard games that maybe put you in a position where you have to start thinking about, okay, like, can you be competitive? You know, what does this roster need? Um, cause man, th- there's it, a lot of things. The The issue is though, is that they're, they're not, putting teams away. You're, you're not finding spots where you can play these guys and you're already, you feel like you're in desperation mode. So the opportunity to play them, it just, if you're, if you're Yudoka, you're like, I don't know, how the hell am I going to put Peyton Pritchard out there? He just got burned on a backdoor cup by Zach Levine, who just jumped right over him. And they're, like, there's nothing he can do about that. He's unfortunately a defensive liability in this game. I can't put him in there. Mm-hmm. They, they're in a spot where you got to beat the Orlando's by 20 plus points and you got to, and you got to be able to get those, that that's, that's how you get them on the floor or they're just going to be out there out of necessity. You see guys get hurt or guys need to take a night off or for one reason or another. And that's how they find their way on the floor, but you can't go through 82 games with, I can't go through 82 players. games. I, well, yeah, but <laughs> with your best players playing 35, 40 minutes a game and then think that you're going to get to the postseason and everything's going to be fresh as lettuce and you're going to continue to grind away. I mean, 
again, Tom, maybe Tom, to your point. Tom Thibodeau might argue that point. Like he can play Julius Randle like 74 minutes a game and, and just hope that he maintains an MVP level. But uh, I agree, uh, especially with Al Horford, uh, because that like I just I, I, it, I hate to be pessimistic, but like he's been really, really good. And it's it, like yes. you said, it's unfair to think that he can maintain that high level as the, the grind of the game's mount up. It's great that he's been able to do what he has. And I'm really encouraged about. You know, know what? Maybe Al, maybe Al's looking for a way out of town. He's like, if I play really well, <laughs> maybe, maybe there, there'll be a, there'll be a trade partner out there for me. And Brad can deal me somewhere else. Someone will say, Al's playing really well. Let's grab him. I've got the perfect spot for him. They trade him to Philadelphia. <laughs> where he's already where he already hated it once yeah. uh for ben simmons who no it, it's funny like i i think actually it, it, we were having this conversation in the office and scout was like ready to throw me through a window um you know to me ben simmons is like the perfect point guard for the boston celtics the problem is like he is the absolute unperfect complement to uh the jays who do not have the killer instinct you cannot right. bring someone who is you know not willing to, <laughs> right. to invest in their team and make him another focal point. Like this would just be the, the skill set, the skill set, yes. exactly what you want. If you could, the personality, the personality yeah. is the opposite of what you uh, want. It's, it, it, and I, I feel bad. Like, cause you know, it, 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 you could probably get him a, a lot cheaper than, than you, you, you might hope. Like maybe I would think if you called uh, and said, Hey, like Marcus smart and some, some young talent and some picks, like, I might be able to, but no, oh no, then now the aggregators are going to, are going to take this and say, Forsberg said trade Marcus Martin picks for Ben Simmons. And I don't, I don't want to deal with that backlash. So uh, that would not work. Um, but I don't know who's out there that would. And that is Brad Stevens challenge to figure out, uh, you know, does he have the right pieces or does he not have the right pieces? So, so what's happening today? What's happening tomorrow? What's happening in the next few days? Are we, are we going to hear about <laughs> the team meeting? Are we going to hear about like sunshine and puppy dogs, baby? Yeah, they, they went down to Florida and everything's fine. Like everyone got together on the plane. And oh my god! So I wrote that story uh, three years ago, 2019, where the Celtics were going through the funk. Kyrie, like I remember, Al it was, Al was like emphatic. We were at, we were at UCLA, beautiful campus, and Al was gushing about like you don't understand. We had this plane ride. We had this come to Jesus moment. Kyrie was like, you know, leading it all, got us playing games on the plane and bringing out the personality. I was like, oh, wow, something's, something's fixed. Then they went out and got like a good win. I think they beat the Lakers or something. And I was, everyone's like, oh, they all bought in. And then they got like absolutely dismantled the rest of the trip. And it was like, oh, the plane ride didn't fix everything. So I do think we'll hear, you know, like they went to Disneyland when they landed in Orlando. <laughs> they, rode, they rode the teacups. Uh, you know, oh, I'm sorry. They went to Universal Studios. Uh, right. You know, there you did, go. Company did, guy did, right there. Company did, guy. They did, did, uh, did, did, you know, went, went uh, got some voodoo donuts on their way in, uh, did all, did all the Harry Potter rides. Uh, and now, uh, now they are fixed. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, it, it's so funny because there's this, there's, there's this amazing cycle with the Celtics right now and, and, and uh, where you, you go to bed, you're infuriated with them. Then you wake up and you're like, well, I wonder how they're going to respond. You know, like I wonder if, if, if things will change. And then they play a game and it go, you know, there's two quarters of really good basketball and then the wheels come off and you just go through the cycle again. And so I'm really worried with this trip. Like Orlando just won. Cole Anthony's dropping 31 points, one spot after Aaron Nismith. It's amazing what happens when you play your young guys. Um, and then they got to go to Miami, who you want to talk about a team that plays defense and plays defense for 48 minutes. Jimmy Butler's going to have those guys ready to go. Then you got to go play Luca. And I know right now the Mavs offense stinks, but they're yeah. going to see the Celtics and they're going to be like, mm, yep. num, num, num. it's a get right game. 40 piece wing dinner coming. Can, can right you imagine I, the Celtics right now are looking like a get right game for some of these teams? Oh God. Like yes. that's, that's not what you I don't want. Know. So ultimately what I hope, what I hope if I'm Ime Yudoka, I huddle my team today. Option. I think they like, they usually like an optional shoot before everybody goes to the plane. So you, you huddle your guys, you're going to watch film. You're going to do all that. You're going to, you, you watch the film. Maybe you pull the bell check. You go bury the tape out back like behind Gillette. And then you, you huddle your guys and you're like, look, I know we were all a little emotional last night. We got to figure this thing out. But the, the number one thing I'm stressing, I say to my game, my team, I go for the next 10 games, defense is our priority. I don't want you to complain when you miss a shot. I want you to just get back, dig in and let your natural defensive talents take over. You're going to get transition opportunities if you get stops, and let's just see what happens. I don't know if players will buy into that. That's not sexy. That doesn't get you on all NBA teams, 
And that's my fear that they just will be like, and eh, that's not fun. But if the Celtics actually did that and invested and got a good win against Orlando, it, the, you know, I would just be curious to see what happens. I, how many points did they score through three quarters last night? They scored it was, so let's see, 103. Man. They scored 103 through three quarters. So they're lighting, they were lighting the world on fire mm-hmm. and they still lost the game. So yeah, they, they put up a crazy number of points. They played well offensively for three quarters and you lost the game. And then, then you're dealing with the repercussions of blowing a 19 point lead. So to your point, yeah, winning defensively, not a lot of guys want to do that in the, in the NBA, but whatever, man, would you rather win ugly or lose by putting up 103 points in three quarters? You'd rather win ugly. Just got to, just got to win. Like, I don't, hey, I don't, you know, hey, it, how about, how about this for the, for, for saving their season? Now you got to get through ooh. this trip first, but okay. November 12th. All right. right. You I'm got listening. Milwaukee. Oh, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. City edition uniforms. <laughs> you almost spit out your drink right there. That's we're going how, full, we're going full Red Sox with uh, the, the yellow full shirts. Red Sox with the marathon uniforms where you want a game. They roll them back out the next game and the next game and the next game and just go on a little win streak with 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 your with with polarizing uniforms. So because like like the Red Sox, people are kind of you're you're either in and out on, on the city edition uniforms or you're just kind of like Ugh, and you don't want to see them wearing them every single night. So, Circle it on your calendar. November so, so twelfth starts I've, I've, starts I've it all. Some, I've got some bad news. So one, uh, <laughs> Nike plans out the jerseys for the year, and I don't think you're allowed to throw audibles. So uh, even if they are good luck, now I wondered, like, they're supposed to also, they're, they're rolling out this throwback court coming up soon, which I'm actually pretty hyped about. It's got like the old school logos and everything kind of playing into the, to the, uh, to the, to the heritage of the team. And uh, I think that'll actually be good. So maybe they can just keep playing on that floor. Cause like, I can't think, I don't think the league can tell you to go back to your normal floor. So maybe there's like some, some cool thing that happens when you use a different parquet, you know, um, uh, maybe that will will help turn them around. But um, also, and I, I have to say this every time because I'm, I'm friendly with people within the Celtics organization, but um, those jerseys stink and they need to stop. <laughs> they need to they need to put some sort of like you can't have your team go to the next generation if you keep just all you do is invest in your past. Like the Celtics as a whole have to stop living on the 1950s and 1960s. No, no you know what? No, you need to. Here, here was my idea for the uniforms. Ooh. Go just embrace the 1980s and roll out the 1980s uniforms. Exact size, shorts, everything. <laughs> shorts for everybody. Bring back the short shorts. Like they, I, it, it felt like they're kind of making a comeback anyways. Like Jalen mm-hmm. likes, you know. They're going to yeah. wear the, they're going to wear the body armor and and the the compression <laughs> pants and shorts anyways. Roll back the short shorts mm. with the the mid eighties uniforms. That'll get, uh, you know. I'm 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 with it. Like, look, something's got to change. Uh, sometimes, as some, I can say, as someone who knows the value of what a good hoodie or a nice pair of glasses can do to your to your talent level on a night to night basis, I'm all for it. Uh, I'm just not sure. Just I just want to see them step outside the comfort zone a little bit. Like, put some orange in their jersey. Um, you ever, you know, when you go over to the Iowa Brack Center and there's those orange flashes on the wall, it looks really nice. Um, a little accent color wouldn't hurt you. There's only so much that shamrock green that you can put on stuff. And they're like, Hey, here's a new hue of green. And, uh, here's a new white outline. And I'm just like, yeah, but the Miami heat have these city edition jerseys that are 97 different colors. And I, I want to buy them. Like I wanted a Kelly Olenek they, jersey because they do it right every year. They seem every, to, every they seem single. to. Year. And if you don't have great old school jerseys to go back to, then 20 years from now, we're still going to have this same problem. Like all these teams are dusting off these cool throwbacks. Like the, 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 the Timberwolves have the old KG arrow coming back. And I don't know, uh, this has been a super depressing podcast and I want to thank everybody <laughs> who made it through all 40 minutes of it. Uh, I wish I could offer you some bit of sunshine. I will say, uh, I'll leave you with one positive. Uh, we tend to be overreactionary here and sometimes you know, you can just have a bad start to a season and kind of figure it out and maybe galvanize behind it. Uh, I'm just left with the sample of past seasons and somewhat concerned about where it goes from here. But uh, Tom Giles, um, thank you for trying, trying to help uh, me. You know what? Find some look, look at it this way. Sometimes maybe, you know, Eme came in and said, you got to break it down to build it back up. 
Mm. So they're breaking it down and then they're going to build it back up. Marcus Smart said that uh, you can't have rainbows without a little bit of rain. It's been raining for like 18 months. Yeah, we're, the we're, winters- we're like living in the Pacific Northwest if that's the case. And we're about to turn back the Rain clocks, which is the stupidest thing on earth. Like, can we abolish daylight savings time? It makes no sense. The three farmers left in Massachusetts will live with the. Hey, ex- I'm from I'm from the farm country, man. <laughs> just because just because you and I don't get up early doesn't mean it doesn't affect people. Uh, you I, know? It, uh, it does, but the the four thirty commute home in in the pitch blackness is uh, is is not great for my sanity. Although I will enjoy the the few weeks of six a.m. tea times that I can get back. Uh, and with that. I need everybody to go like, subscribe. <laughs> if you really want to get depressed, you can watch us. The the, the energy just melt right out of us on, on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, we'll catch you next time on the Celtics Are a Hot Mess podcast.